My name is Devin. I am a recovered alcoholic, and uh, and I'm I'm really overjoyed that you guys showed up. Uh, what I've been able to gather from everybody is this has been an amazing weekend for you guys. It was certainly special for me. Uh, I, I got to talk to all these speakers over the last couple of days, or that we've had for the last couple of days about a week ago, and uh, and I knew a lot of you, and I got to meet a lot of you, and everybody. Uh, Everybody was just so wonderful, and it touched my heart just getting to have all these conversations with you guys behind the scenes, so I want to thank you for that. We're going to uh, open this meeting with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. We're going to read this anonymity statement one last time. There may be some here who are not familiar with our tradition of personal anonymity at the public level. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Thus, we respectfully ask that AA speakers and AA members not be photographed, videotaped, or identified by full name on audio tapes or in any published or broadcast reports of our meetings, including those reports on the internet or other new media technologies. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our efforts to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles become before personalities. Please note that the conference is being recorded and try to be mindful of this when you have the opportunity to share. Thank you. And that also goes for people maybe doing screen grabs on there. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you don't do that. Thank you so much. This is the AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And tonight I've asked a really nice, a good friend of mine named Matt to read the steps. Uh, good evening, family. My name is Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Devin, thank you for asking me to, uh, to do this. 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. And I've asked my good friend Tika to read both traditions. Hi, my name's Tika, and I'm an alcoholic. Devin, thank you for asking me to participate in this way. The speakers have been amazing. This has been a savior this weekend. Um, tradition one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on AA unity. Tradition two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Tradition three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except 
and matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Tradition five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Tradition seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Tradition eight, Alcoholics Anonymous rem will, should remain forever non-professional, uh, but our service centers may employ special workers. Tradition nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Tradition 10, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Tradition 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And lastly, tradition 12, anonymity is our spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, my sobriety date is uh, August 28th, 2011. And uh, I got to meet Rich. It was uh, in October of 2016. And uh, my, my home group has this thing where you have to have five years to speak at the big book meeting. And I was so excited. I just had five years in that August and someone had asked me to speak at our big book meeting on step six and seven. And I get a call from this guy, Mark, who's a, a great friend of mine. And he calls and he goes, Hey, who's picking the speakers at your home group? Cause I got this guy in town and he would be awesome if you can come and get him on Monday. And this is Sunday. And, and I believe my response to Mark was, well, we have a great speaker lined up tomorrow. It's me. And I'm doing that. And, uh, and we hung up the phone and, and it dawned on me that if there was anybody that was pop able to step away, you know, a home group member and someone who, you know, is going to be around a lot, uh, I have multiple opportunities to do that. Uh, and so I reached out to him and I said, you know what, it actually seems like a perfect idea. And, uh, and he gave me this guy Rich's phone number and I got in touch with him and, and he said he would absolutely come the next day or so and, uh, and would speak. And, uh, and in that meeting, Rich said a couple of things around those steps that, that changed for me my uh, the way I look at them and it changed my life and uh, and so I'm really happy he's here tonight he means a lot to me he's touched me at a level that was really deep and I hope he gets to do that to all of you tonight and with that I'm going to introduce uh, our last speaker for this conference uh, Rich B from Ocean City Maryland hey my name is Rich I'm alcoholic have, have I been unmuted uh, nice um, well, my wife's unhappy about that, but you know, you guys will at least get to hear me. She'd love to control the mute button like you are. Um, I, I also just, um, you know, heard what you had to say and I just learned a new thing. I'm not sure what a, a, a screen grab is, uh, but it sounds exciting. Um, I don't know that I've ever been screen grabbed or, or any other kind of, gra after you've been quarantined as long as I have things like screen grabs, right, are, are exciting. We've had all the, the spiritual speakers and, and the step gurus that'll go through this all, all weekend long. Um, in case you guys don't know, um, they give you all the content in these spots, you know, all weekend. And I learned this years ago, I was lucky enough uh, to get to go to my first spots out, out in Colorado. Um, I met Tom and Juanita. I fell in love with the enchiladas. Juanita, if, if you're around, uh, I still haven't forgotten those and, and the whole um, process of, of the FOTS experience. And then when it's all over and all these amazing people give you amazing content, they bring in an idiot at the very end just to tell stories. And, um, and that's me and, and you're stuck with me to close this thing out for you. And um, I'm in Ocean City, Maryland right now, which this Zoom thing, I mean, I, I didn't see it coming, and we've, we've heard all the people talk about it. I mean, this was a lot better than a five-hour drive to Manhattan. Uh, I've been in four different countries so far this week, you know, getting to share time uh, with AA. This little island, If uh, for those of you that haven't been here, it's, you know, about a half a mile off the coast of Maryland. We're a little island. It's seven miles long by one mile wide, and um, and we're pretty isolated, and, it, and it's pretty weird, and I'm pretty alone, and I... Um, I miss the heck out of you guys, I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. I just miss you. It's not the same. This is cool. 
Uh, but I'm a guy that likes to hug your neck, man, and see your eyes and your face. And uh, today I walked out front and uh, I was surfing for two or three hours out front looking both ways. And there was like one or two people as far as the eye could see. Um, so this thing is this thing is saving my butt. I don't know what it's going to do as far as with them was saying, whether anybody else gets touched, but it sure has touched me and saved my bacon just getting to be a part of this thing this weekend. Uh, so thank you. Um, the only thing I want to say about what's been going on in my morning prayer and meditation and my belief, and if you think different right on, I hope I don't upset anyone. I'm trying to spread a little optimism. I kind of feel like I'm getting to be a part of the greatest worldwide global awakening that has or certainly ever will take place in my lifetime. And each morning I pray and I say, God, Please help me be grateful, see where I can be useful, and be optimistic about what I'm getting to partake in here um, of a global awakening. And when I look at it through those eyes each day, uh, it doesn't seem bad at all. It seems almost exciting. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, bad going on. Seeming, I, I don't like those words anymore, good and bad. There, there's a lot of things that may not be uh, as I would have them in in the moment, but we're all familiar with that. If there's anyone who's familiar with that, it's us, right? That the dark comes before the dawn, right? When it seems the darkest, that's when spectacular things are about to happen, and I'm already watching them happen. Uh, but nobody invited me here for a current events address. I just wanted to share with you what's on my heart, and that is um, I feel alone. Um, I miss you, and I um, and I think we're a part of something great in the long haul. So, and more than that, we're in it together. So with that said, uh, I was separated from alcohol on August the 30th of 04. Um, I didn't quit drinking or, you know, put the plug in the jug. My best thinking didn't bring me to AA. None of that. That would all imply that I have power, choice, and control over whether or not I drink. I don't have any of that. Um, on August the 29th of that year, I was as drunk as I'd ever been. And on August the 30th, I didn't have to take a drink all day. There's no step in our book for that. There's no paragraph. You didn't have anybody speak on that this week. And hey, let's talk about, you know, step zero, so to speak, right? And you know what step zero is? It was the greatest miracle that ever took place in my life, right? For some reason, somehow, the universe, God, whatever name you like, saw fit to do something, right? Something that was indeed miraculous where I didn't have to take a drink for the first day in a very, very long time. And then I was, you know, delivered to you guys who taught me how to accept that amazing gift to protect it and to respect it. And I believe that we accept it, respect it, and protect it through those 12 steps and 12 traditions uh, that we've heard so much about by so many wonderful people. And, um, just to connect, I want to like shout out to all these names. I see my friends that I just love and care about all across the country, but I would leave somebody out. Uh, but I see you all, man. And, and uh, oh. so I grew up three hours from here in Baltimore, Maryland. My mother and father don't drink. I, don't know, I have one little sister, three years younger. She doesn't drink. I'm from a, no aunts and uncles, grandparents. I'm from a non-drinking, like really nice morality, integrity, wonderful family. Um, but I don't see it that way, right? When I'm in third grade, my parents took me out of this little public school that I was going to. I just remember my only memories up to third grade were that everything was cool. If you said, tell us specifically why things were cool, I don't remember. I was going up to third grade, right? I just remember I had lots of little friends. School seemed fun. And then the next thing you know, my parents took me out of that school, sent me on a 45-minute bus ride to this other school, uh, that I now know was a private school. They were trying to give me a better education. They were trying to make my life better than theirs. I didn't see it that way. I was going to hate my parents for that for like 20 years. Like, why would you do that to a kid? Rip him away from all his friends and send him on this long school bus ride. Um, there were some other things that happened on that bus. The older kids sit in the back of the bus. The younger kids sit in the front. Um, it's like a social hierarchy on a school bus, right? And if you go to the back of the bus, you get beat up. And that school assigned me a kid. His name was Reed. And Reed's job was to just beat me up every day for something. Uh, there was a girl that, that rode the bus that was just smoking hot. I mean, just 
like a lot of you all that are in this call me. She was good looking, man. And I didn't know how to talk to her. I didn't know how to ask her out. I mean, I had nothing going on uh, with this girl, Nikki. And that magical thing happened that everybody's described in their own way. Uh, that was my first memorable drinking experience. I think I was in seventh grade. And some of the older kids said, you want to skip last class and do some drinking. And I never skipped any class. I'd never done any drinking. And I said, you bet, like I'd been doing it all along. And um, they said, well, what do you drink? And I said, bourbon. And I have no idea where I got that from because I'd never had anything. And, um, you know, I, I wish that was true. I wish I got to tell you that my first drink was bourbon because I kind of think that's my ego likes that. That's pretty manly. Uh, but in fact, what those guys had was peach schnapps. And when I have to tell you that, that's pretty weenie, right? It's like the opposite of manly. Uh, but that was my first drink and it did the trick. It also uh, teaches me in hindsight, right? It teaches me a lot about my alcoholism because it's not what I drank. It's not how often I drank. It's not what it did to me because alcohol does to the human body the same thing to people across the board, right? It's a depressant. If you put enough of it in your body, it's a poison. Chemically, you, you will expel it. It's alcohol poison. That happens to anybody if you put enough alcohol in them. Uh, you put enough alcohol in a non-alcoholic and put them behind the wheel of a car, they'll get a DUI eventually if you do it enough times. That's just, you know, that's statistics, right? You put enough alcohol in a non-alcoholic for a long enough period of time and stop abruptly, they'll shake and twitch and sweat and go through all those early parts of the DTs that we experienced. Doesn't make you alcoholic. That's just what alcohol does to the human body. But what it does for me, right? unbelievable right i'm willing to let it do so much to me in exchange for what it does for me that's what's not normal right most people don't get that effect from alcohol silky calls it you know i drink because of the effect produced by alcohol that would have been good stuff to know in seventh grade i wish i'd have had some of that information i'd have probably disregarded it but i didn't have any of that information we're passing the peach schnapps around and after drinking this down with the fellas for a while I noticed for the first time in my life that I felt like these guys were as lucky to be hanging out with me as I was with them. We were just kind of shoulder to shoulder, you know, one of the boys. And I wanted to feel like that my whole life. And then I went to get on the school bus and I was going to sit next to Nikki on that bus because somehow after drinking under this peach schnapps, I intuitively knew how to handle this situation with women that used to baffle me. And I get on the school bus and I'm walking to the back to sit next to Nikki and Reed gets up from his seat to give me my daily beating. And as he's getting to his feet, I give him everything I got, man. And Reed goes down and out. And Reed's out cold. I mean, he is out. And the whole school bus got really, really quiet. And I sit down next to Nikki. I'm looking at Nikki and Nikki's looking at me and I'm looking at Nikki and in this silence, man, it was like the most spectacular moment of my life. And then we get to Nikki's bus stop. And before she gets off the school bus, she leans over and gives me this little kiss that's like half on my lips and half on my cheek. And this was very different, I assure you, than the way that my mother, my aunts, when anyone can. I mean, I felt this in my toes. This was very different. And it was amazing. And when I got off the bus, I went into my house and I was in big trouble. I was obviously drunk. My parents left me in the bathroom to get sick all night. I was grounded forever, right? That's a big deal in seventh grade. That's like life without parole for you prison guys. I can still see a couple of the tats as I scroll through. Um, it's a big deal, right? And so you don't know when it's going to end. And, uh, and under those conditions, I woke up that next morning with my head kicked around the toilet bowl. You know how we sleep, man. Um, I got the stiff neck. I'm sick as a dog. I, I don't remember ever being, you know, hung over like that before. And I'm grounded forever. And the thought came, right? The thought came, are you ever going to do any more of that drinking? Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? Grounded forever and sick as a dog. What a small price to pay, right? For what I had going on on that school bus with Reed and Nikki and that long overdue respect. And what I didn't know was that experience set in motion, and I can't say it better than Bill. I, 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 I hate to steal from the book all the time because I don't want to be one of those guys. I just can't say it any better, right? My relationship with alcohol was set in flight, much like a boomerang, that while that thing was going out, it was going to give me so much for so long and do so much for me that was amazing. I mean, I'm not here with you tonight because, you know, I hated drinking. 
I don't know. I don't even understand that. It, it was the bright spot of my life, man, for a long, long time. And then that boomerang was going to one day turn in flight and come back. And it was going to take from me or I was going to give to it, however you like to say it, every bit of morality, every bit of integrity, everything decent that those wonderful parents gave me. And you know the damnedest thing about it? It was going to do that turn and come back on me so slow that I didn't know it was happening. Right? That's the thing about alcoholism. It happened so slow. One drink at a time, I'm surrendering everything decent inside me to this thing called alcoholism, and I don't even know I'm doing it. And I fast forward. You know, up through high school, I get in a lot of trouble. I get arrested a lot. They leave me. My parents are the kind that leave me at jail on the weekends. They say, if you know, if you get arrested, you get yourself in, you get yourself out. We didn't raise you like that. Don't bother wasting your one phone call on us because we're not coming. Um, and you know what I think? I think that's a cool story. On Monday, when I go into my little private high school and they're like, what'd you do this weekend? I'm like, I was in jail, right? Like, like it gives me street cred in like a private lacrosse high school. Like you need street cred there, but I don't, you know, I see things weird. And uh, I, I rolled a Jeep in high school, almost killed three friends, drunk, uh, had a keg of beer in the back, a CJ7, right, with no doors, windows, or roof. Uh, that might capture the attention, right, of an average temperate drinker, hard drinker maybe would wake up after something like that. Not me. I mean, that stuff goes right past. I actually brag about it, right? I think that that was, I say things like, did you see that? That was amazing drunk driving. I rolled that Jeep, it rolled three times. We all walked away. I mean, that was like NASCAR. I mean, did you see that? And, uh, you know, normal people don't get, they don't even, that's, that's not even funny, right? But in an AA meeting, we talk about our drunk driving and, you know, stories where we're all nodding and stuff. Yeah, I had that. Um, so that's my high school. Uh, I get to college because I remember things. I, I just heard, uh, you know, Carrie, I liked a couple of things in particular. She was saying about six and seven and, and then some of the earlier speakers on six and seven. Um, what I know from six and seven is that God gives each and every one of us a very unique, separate and different set of talents, assets, if you like to call them that. Uh, we're each good at stuff, man, that we bring to the big table of Alcoholics Anonymous to make it a spectacular dinner right and we all bring something and as long as we're bringing the best of what we got this thing keeps getting bigger and stronger and right now by the way i think that those of us with computer skills and gifts and a little bit technology savvy have something super special to offer alcoholics anonymous maybe this is your moment to shine right these next couple of months maybe 12 step work looks different and some of these people that have been quiet right our computer nerds in aa maybe this is their moment man. you get to help these old guys figure out Zoom and go to meeting and how computer platforms work. Maybe the whole nature of 12 step work, right? Has to adapt and change. Um, there I go, I go down these rabbit holes. Anyways, what I know about me from six and seven uh, is that one of the things God gave me is that I can remember things, right? When I read a book, this is my big book. When I read a, any, any book, you know, I read it and I remember it, period. It's over. That doesn't make me smart. That doesn't make me intelligent. None of that. It means that I got a good memory and I did nothing to earn that, work on it, deserve it. None of that. It's an absolute thing. You know, you're kind of born fast or you're born slow. I was pretty fast. I was good at sports. A combination of getting straight A's. Um, you know, it's very rare. I, I think I got one or two B's ever, not because I studied and not because I'm smart. I read a book and I vomit it back up, right? So because of that, I get to go to college, I get a scholarship between that and soccer. I picked the University of San Diego uh, because of a combination of things. Uh, I learned how to surf, by the way. Bef I, I don't remember like learning. I, I was before five years old. It's one of the greatest gifts my dad gave me. Um, and I still surf almost every day. Um, that's where I really feel connected. To, to the universe and you know going down a wave and gliding my hand i feel like i'm dragging my hand man right across the face of god and it's the most pure beautiful thing in my life and i'm grateful i got to do a little bit of that today but anyways i picked the university of san diego because of good surfing far away from my parents and beautiful women in southern california and i'm not sure that that's how a normal person picks a college right but that's how i picked it it was a jesuit college i didn't know what jesuits were i didn't care i should have looked into that uh, that turns out to be important later, but I was paying no attention uh, to what Jesuits were. 
in Southern California, the deal seemed to me that I was going to need some stuff. I was going to have to acquire some stuff, right? If I was going to get any of you beautiful ladies to go out with a guy like me, it was going to have to be first class. And one of the things I knew, no woman ever told me, you're ugly, you're an idiot, you know, beat it, nothing, right? I just knew inside that I wasn't good enough. And that if I was going to take you out, I was going to have to have flowers, a nice car, a nice, you know, it's going to have to be a production, right? First class. Um, and that's what it was going to take for you to like me. And that set me on a course. I don't know if you remember in Bill's story where he's talking about working on that farm. And he says this was to be the last honest day's labor that I was going to do, right? And then the exciting lore and maelstrom of Wall Street were on, right? The shucking and jiving, the quick deals, the fast buck, right? That became, I didn't know I was making that decision. Man, I'm a kid. I'm like 19, 20, however old you are when you go to college. I don't even remember. Um, all I know is, you know, there, there I am, and I, I, I got to get some stuff if I'm going to, like, do okay in Southern California with the ladies. A couple of the guys on the soccer team were from about 29 miles south. 29 miles south of San Diego is Tijuana, California. Uh, I'm sorry, Tijuana, Mexico, just below the California-Mexico border. It, 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 I could get there a lot quicker than I could get to Los Angeles even. And... Uh, and these four guys on my soccer team, they each had like, it seemed like they each had 50 cousins, man, that lived just on the other side of the border. And they knew how to get this, you know, green stuff that the rich kids at the college like smoking. And now I get involved in this little, little thing where we're bringing that up from Mexico. And I'm, I'm helping, you know, the rich kids get that. I'm drinking a lot to be able to fall asleep at night because we've already heard about it. There's a principle, it's a spiritual principle, which means, I like spiritual principles, by the way. Spiritual principles are like gravity, right? You don't have to agree with gravity. In fact, I could push you off the roof, and you can tell me how there's no such thing as gravity all the way to the ground right before you splat, right? But, and gravity doesn't really care whether I believe in gravity. In fact, there's nothing gravity cares less about whether I, but gravity doesn't even care what I call it. Right. I could call it the thing that makes me fall to the ground after I go off a roof. I could come up with some other name for it. Right. The fast falling thing. Or I could just say gravity. Right. But I got problems with the G word. Anyways, this spiritual principle is water seeks its own level. You hang out with that which you are. I'm always drawn to that which I am. And the other, you know, the other spiritual principle that I've found to be true is that a clear conscience makes for a soft pillow. And a lot of my drinking uh, has to do with when I live in direct violation to my own internal principles, okay? Which by the way, I, I discovered what my principles were that I've been violating for years and years and years through the steps we've heard talked about, right? And my, my fourth step was every bit as good as the fifth step listener, right? That's the for me, that's my experience with, with inventory. It's only as good as the listener. <laughs> it's not what I write. It's what they extract out of me. And that's why I like to fourth and fifth step we, or tenth step now, whatever number you want to put on it. Uh, I do it all the time, and I like to do it with a lot of different people because they're good at pulling stuff out, right? And what, what I, you know, eventually figure out other than that, that I'm always the problem right, in, in every relationship, is that I'm always the guy um, seeking this connection, and I don't know that I'm doing that, and we talk a lot about that in, in AA, is seeking this connection, and I was doing that in, in a million different ways back then. I eventually, by my senior year at that college, um, I, I'd been arrested a lot by this point. I, I will tell, I've been arrested 36 times. I've gone to jail 36 times. Um, I've never gotten a break. I'm not a prison guy for the prison guys on here. I'm not that level of badass um, in, in Maryland. And, you know, jail is any sentence up to 18 months. If you get more than 18 months, you go to prison. That always represented a much longer term commitment than a guy like me was you know, willing to make. I'm not really a long term commitment kind of guy. And um, I'm also not that smart because here, here's the deal. When I get arrested for something and I go to court and they reduce, they say, we're going to drop the distribution and uh, you're going to plead out to the simple possession. And I do that and I get a six month sentence and I come back and I tell you, I'm like, hey, hey, Bobby H, man. Hey, I beat it. I beat the rap, man. I think I, 
I only got six months, right? And then I violate probation and I go back for three months and then I get 60 days and I violate probation, I get nine months, right? And it goes on and on. And my sponsor pointed out to me when we're doing this stuff, he's like, you do know you were never beating it. You were serving a life sentence. You were just too stupid to realize it. You were serving it on the installment program a little bit at a time. So that that's what you're dealing with. And, um, you know, by my senior year there, I'd, I'd switch. I was halfway through my senior year. I'd switch to selling the white stuff. It was a lot more money. And I'm drinking and drinking and drinking because I'm living against my principles. And I don't know what that's going on. And again, with that fourth and fifth step, I discovered my principles by seeing what offended me, right, in the fourth and the fifth step. There was a series of girls, right, that cheated on me, left me, cheated on me, left me, cheated on me, left me, cheated on me, left, right? And my sponsor goes, hey, it seems that you don't like when people cheat on you. And I go, yeah. And he goes, so you think that you should just be with one person when, when you care about them and you make a commitment to do that and you should honor that commitment, huh? And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, that's called monogamy. Let's write that over here on a piece of paper. That's going to be useful later, right? And so I, I didn't know the names of a lot of these things, right, that, that I, I was internally violating. Um, but you know what I did know is that I had to do one of two things, stay drunk or kill myself. Those were my two choices when you're living life like I am, because my book tells me that often the alcoholic lives a double life. And if I'd have only had two going, that would have been pretty good. I have a 3.8 GPA. I'm like the top of my class. I'm bringing in all of this stuff. Halfway through my senior year, I'm living in this house. I bought my first house cash illegally, of course, 423 Nautilus Street, Winded Sea Beach in La Jolla. It's one of the most beautiful you know, surf spots in the world. But by this point, I, I don't surf anymore because I drink. And when you drink like I drink, everything has to go. I'm driving a BMW convertible. It's got a number on the back that lets you know that they had to ship this in from Europe because I'm really important, right? You guys got to know that. So I got to have the car that shows that. I'm dating the prettiest girl at the college. I have no idea if I liked her, but you all said that she was the prettiest and I had to impress you, so I dated her. And, um, you know, next thing I know, it's about 4.30 in the morning. And boom, 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 boom. Every door and window in that house came in. I'm on my stomach. They're putting the plastic zip ties on. And off I go to the federal penitentiary for the, you know, it's called the Metropolitan Correction Center from the California people. Uh, they call it MCC. It's the federal prison in downtown San Diego. Uh, San Diego Union Tribune, Los Angeles Times wrote a little article it said Jesuit student, 27 kilos of cocaine. Uh, I know that because my mother's a retired first grade school teacher. And I don't know what you know about elementary school teachers, but they laminate everything. And uh, so my mom laminated them and, and saved those. That's, that's helpful, by the way, when you get to your step work, when your mom just presents you with stuff. So um, I go in there and I'm, I'm in there. I was the only guy in that penitentiary that was guilty, and I know that because they talked about it. It holds about 1,600 men. Uh, they were all innocent. They, they told me so every day. And they told stories like I had told my entire life. They would say things like, the reason I'm in here is because of my mechanic. And if my mechanic had fixed my car correctly, that taillight, the cop would have never pulled me over for having the taillight out. He was supposed to fix that. And then when they pulled me over, they smelled alcohol on my breath, asked me to step from the vehicle, and then they searched my car, instant to arrest, found the dope in the trunk. You could see that the reason I'm in here is because of my mechanic. And if I ever get out of here, we're going to get this straightened out, me and that mechanic. And you know what? If you hook that dude up to a lie detector, he'll pass it. He'll absolutely pass it because he believes that. And that's how I lived my entire life, right? Always somebody else's fault. I had very little to do with anything. And for the first time in my life in that federal penitentiary, I realized that I was where I was because of who I was and that I was who I was because of how I lived. And I'm going to repeat that because that is the beginning of the biggest awakening I've ever had in my life. I was where I was because of who I was. And I was who I was because of how I lived. Alcoholics Anonymous operates on exactly that same principle. What that principle is, is you all don't care about my intentions. The world could care less what I intend. Right. My tombstone's not going to say here lies Rich Bruckner. He meant well. Right. Nobody cares what I meant. Most of us, certainly me, I never went out at night. Right. With ill intentions. 
let's take a Friday night. I'm in the shower getting ready to go. It's the pregame shower. I don't know if you guys remember this. It's about nine o'clock on a Friday night. You've got a bunch of money. And uh, you're in that shower. There's a nice cold Heineken or whatever you like up on that shower shelf. The hot water's hitting you. You're drinking that cold Heineken. It's number three or four, right? It's setting and you're getting ready. to. Get. It's going to be a great night. Get out of the shower, get dressed, put on a silk shirt. I'm getting ready to head into L.A., spray on a little girl sauce in case I meet one of you ladies, you know, and then May calls me and says, hey, Rich, you got any plans tonight? And I go, yeah, thanks for the call, May. Tonight's the night that I'm going to shame my mother to where she can't look her only an oldest son in the eyeballs for about a decade. What are you up to? And George calls and says, hey, Rich, what are you up to? And I go, George, thanks for calling, man. You know what I'm up to tonight? I'm going to embarrass my little sister where she doesn't speak a single word to me for six and a half years. I never intended either of those things to happen. I never had an intent like that. But both of those things did happen in my life. So that was a big deal for me, sitting in that penitentiary and, and having those awakenings, right? And isn't it crazy to start to get spiritually free and to become liberated, right? while confined some of us may be having that experience right now in our homes where we're getting free happy and doing this thing called alcoholics anonymous with some of this free time that uh we seem to have been given right maybe we're doubling down on prayer and meditation reading a new book trying something new trying a suggestion from my sponsor checking out some new weird meditation right i got all kinds of time i don't know about you right now everything's closed here but anyways I'm in that cell and that's what's happening. I'm getting free. At least having some big things happen, right? I'm in there about nine and a half months. It's coming up on trial and it turns out that the DEA agents had some problems of honesty of their own. They lied on the affidavits to get the search warrants. It was determined to be an illegal search. The case could not proceed to trial. I'd love to tell you I walked out of there a free man. Uh, but anybody that's served any time in the penitentiary, you, you know what you are. When you're an alcoholic, like I'm an alcoholic, the day you get out, you are thirsty. I mean, and now I'm drinking to just blot out. I mean, I am drinking for oblivion. I cannot go back to the East Coast. I have shamed, embarrassed, used up everybody that loves and cares about me. The more you love me, the more I suck you dry. I turn every hair on your head gray and I don't care. The people that don't love me and aren't that close to me, they're long since done with me, man. But the ones that love me the most are the ones I just bleed them dry. And then I get to Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And I tell the biggest lie any of us tell, right? I was only hurting myself. And I start bouncing around. I go to a town called Ketchum, Idaho, and I drink there until I get warrants. And when I get warrants, I run away because I'm a coward. Tough guys face the music. They walk through the fire. I uh, leave Sun Valley. I run over to a town called Steamboat. I'm in Steamboat for a while until I get some warrants. I run away. I go to a town called Jackson, Wyoming. I'm, I'm there for a while. I love theirs. One of my favorite bars is in Jackson. I, I think I saw somebody here at the meeting from, from Cheyenne or somewhere in Wyoming that maybe knows this place. It's called the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar. And what I liked about this place is the bar stools are actually real saddles, right? And the saddles are bolted to these poles. And when you go in this place and you like step over, you know what I mean? And you, you get down in that saddle. I mean, you're like in for the night. It's a real feeling of commitment. It's like that ease and comfort that comes at once just getting in the saddle. And I put a bunch of money up on the bar to, you know, let you know uh, that, you know, what's going on here. And one of the beautiful women, you know, looks at me and says, Hey, what's your story, cowboy? And I look at her right in her eyes and I say, I'm traveling, babe. I'm just traveling. Right? Like I'm a romantic sojourner across our great nation. I'm like one step ahead of the warrants in the last state. And I'm completely on the run and I'm totally delusional. And I eventually wind up after the Jackson Hole warrants. I wind up where all big shot, tough guy, wannabe drug dealers wind up when the federal government had seized everything. All my bank accounts, cars, houses, you name it. Alcohol owned me lock, stock and barrel, man. It told me when to wake up, when to, it told me everything. I don't want to be gross. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And um, I wind up where a lot of us wind up, back on my mom's couch, man, in Ocean City, Maryland. And I couldn't even believe my mom took me in and was going to give me another chance. And I'm starting to come in and out of AA, and I hate AA. I hate everybody in AA, but I hate one person more than anyone. Uh, her name is Janine, 
And, and Janine always had the book with her, right? She was like 16, 18 years sober when I met her, right? And I'm thinking, why do you have the stupid book with you, right? I, do, I, I don't get it. And, um, you know, are, are you like slow or something? Because you got to remember, I read a book and I remember it. So therefore, I think everybody, right? It's, I'm arrogant, I'm a jerk, I'm stupid, I'm judgmental. And, and here's us what I don't like. She doesn't call her sponsees sponsees. She doesn't call them pigeons like the old timers. She calls all these girls she sponsors duckies, right? And it's like disgusting to me. And, and when she comes into a meeting, there's six or seven duckies always following her with their stupid little books. And, uh, you know, they come in and they all sit next to each other, which I think is, you know, awful. Hey, I just realized this is a, uh, my book cover, guys. That's a, uh, that's a Fox 2011 that make it that's pretty cool i didn't even wasn't even thinking about that but uh one more connection i feel to you guys that's probably why i was tearing up in the beginning of this so anyways if i see janine in a meeting i leave before the thing starts right and uh, they, they do this thing at our meetings where they give out chips for like 30 60 90 days you, you get 10 seconds to say how you did it and it would be like, you know, does anybody have 30 days? And some little girl named Rebecca or something that Janine sponsored would come running up to get her 30 day chip. And I'm in the back dying of alcoholism, right? I'm in like my 10,000th meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm under the belief that the more of these meetings I go to, I'm gonna like mysteriously recover, right? It's been pointed out to me by some of you that that's the same logic that if I go sit in my garage, I don't turn into a Ferrari, right? Uh, sitting in the garage never turns you into a car, but I thought that like sitting in AA, uh, something was going to happen. But anyways, I'm in the back. I'm hating. Little Rebecca would come up. My name's Rebecca. I have 30 days. Janine's my sponsor. I'm starting to write my inventory. I'm getting free. Ah! And I'd be in the back of the meeting thinking to myself, I'm going to punch her and I'm going to knock her teeth so far down her throat that that girl will never smile again. Does anybody have 60 days? And Teresa would come up. My name's Teresa. I have 60 days. I did my inventory. I'm starting my ninth step. I'm getting free. We right. And she would like same thing. I eventually make it to 36 days without a drink, no sponsor, no steps. All of those things were for you know you folks because you had nice lives, right? Like surely your inventory couldn't look like mine. I'm not stupid. I could read your steps. I see what's coming. Right. And I don't write anything down. I mean, the IRS is looking for me. I got warrants in three states. I got five driver's licenses, none of them with my real name. And you guys want me to write things down in my line of work. That is the first rule. You don't write anything down. It's called a paper trail. I just got out of federal prison and I'm not going back. Right. The only problem with that is that I'm dying. I'm dying. And at 36 days, I'm 29 years old. I had my liver biopsy. That should have been a hint, but you know, I don't really listen to doctors at Johns Hopkins and that's where I went. I mean, what, what does a doctor from Johns Hopkins know? I mean, the people I take advice from are like bartenders and drug dealers because they know stuff, certainly not, you know, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the guy tells me that if you take any Tylenol whatsoever, your liver's in bad shape. Um, it'll shut your liver down at 36 days. I make the ultimate coward decision to take myself out. I take as much Tylenol law and everything in the medicine cabinet as I can. I believe the book talks about that as the jumping off place. I couldn't go one more day, not drinking. And I knew I couldn't take so much as one more drink. And, um, I collapse. I end up the neighbor calls 911. That's a miracle. I don't have time to tell you about that lady happened to be home from work on a Tuesday. Uh, she hadn't missed a day's work in over nine years. She was one of those like perfect attendants at work people. Right. And her first sick day. And she happened to, you know, look through the window, see my me, a body on the ground calls 911. I wake up in Atlantic general hospital. Um, I'm in a paper gown. I'm almost dead. I'm hooked up to all these things. And y'all know when I come to, man, I'm like looking, I'm figuring out where I am. I'm realizing that I'm such a loser. I can't even kill myself the right way. And you know who's at the end of the bed? Janine with the duckies, right? And I have no idea if there's a real place called alcoholic hell or not, uh, but I'm pretty sure I was in it if it exists. And Janine did not talk to me that day. But she did talk to the duckies, right? Janine had tried to talk to me a lot. And this day she just talked to the girls and she said, girls, I want you to take a good look. This is what happens to an alcoholic that refuses to take our steps. 
Let's go, girls. And that was it, man. I I couldn't even believe it. I'm the person that sponsors, like, bring their sponsees or duckies in her case uh, to see, like, how to not do Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, here's here's the case study for poor Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I'll be honest, I was pissed when I eventually read the book. And again, I saw that in Bill's hospital room, you remember what Bill got? Bill got this magnificent bright light, a cool breeze flowed through and through. And I got Janine and the duckies. I mean, you got to be kidding me. But it turns out that what I got, what I got was every bit as significant. Because after they left, I had a thought that I, I've never had in my life. And the thought was that if I get out of here, if I live through this, right, if I actually survive through this, when I get out of here, I'm going to find one of those old guys with that smile on their face and that book in their hand, and I'm going to do everything they tell me to do. And in case you haven't picked up on it, I don't listen to what anybody tells me to do. And uh, so that was, I'm not sure where a thought like that comes from, but I bet you guys have some thoughts, right? And I've never had one like that before or since. And I embarked on this journey. My first sponsor was a man named Jim. He had 40 some years sober when he started helping me. Jim had a sponsor by the name of Clarence Snyder, who had a sponsor by the name of Dr. Bob Smith. I like knowing that because I like knowing what he was giving me. And he started taking me through this deal and reading it and in a way of explaining it in real down to earth terms that I knew he was a guy that actually experienced this stuff. And he told me stories like I'm telling you. He didn't talk at the steps or at God. He told stories where I could see God. And there's a beautiful book if anybody's you know utilizing some free time. It's called The Spirituality of Imperfection by Ernest Kurtz. And in that book, he talks about one of the reasons that AA works so well is that we don't try to talk at, about God and describe him and here's how you pray and here's how you make your approach and here's what he looks like. Like there's places trying to do that all over the world every Sunday morning, trying to tell people what God's like, what he does and doesn't do. And here's how to pray and not pray and all that. And hey, we don't do any of that. You know what we do? We just share our stories. And in those stories, we experience God. We feel him. We see him. We experience him. And we get to watch more miracles than any group of people I've ever seen. I could go through, if I started sliding this, you know, I could tell the stories of the people I'm looking at on this Zoom call that I've watched the miracles in their life, and it's nothing short of amazing. But anyways, um, we get to the point where uh, you know I do that inventory. I guess I want to say this about step one. He explained that I'm a guy with less power, right? Power less, less power. He's like, I know you think you're really smart, but can you understand that? Power less, less power. I'm like, yes, Jim, I'm not an idiot. And he said, well, can you think of any decision? The second part of the step, this thing about your life being unmanageable. Is there any decision that you've made time and time and time again in your life? And I said, yes, Jim, that I'm never going to take another drink. And he said, how are you doing managing that decision? How's it going? I said, not very well, Jim. And he said, okay, that's step one. You're a guy that has a hard time managing. You've got less power, right? I have less power than is required to manage my most sincere desire to never take another drink. And that means I'm going to need to get some power. Thank God that's what the whole rest of the program's about. It's a getting power program, right? Um, you know, personally, you're, you're, you're not going to hear me, uh, you know, frumping around talking about them like Eeyore, right? I'm powerless over people, places, and things. I'm powerless over people, places, and things. Right? That's not what my book says. My book tells me I've been given the power. It's not mine. we got to be real clear on that. But I've been given the power to help where no one else can. Where no one else can. That's a hell of a business card, right? I got some up here that say some other things. But you know the most important business card? You know what it would say? I'm just looking at some names on the screen. Bob H., agent of God. Lois from PA, agent of God. Tim P., agent of God. That's a heck of a job assignment, right? And it's such an assignment that my job is to just clear out these pipes so I can get the purest channel of him coming through me to help others that is possible. And there is no feeling like that. And in fact, it is such a responsibility that I'm inclined, a guy like me, I want to shuck it off and pretend that I don't have the responsibility to do that. It's easier for me to just say, 
<sighs> can't get them drunk, can't get them sober, then to assume the responsibility of going through these steps, getting hooked up with this power that I have an absolute obligation to share with somebody else and to put their hand into that hand of that power and to watch their life change forever as they run with it. But anyways, I eventually get up, you know, to eight and nine, which is what I want to talk to you about in finishing up this, this talk. I four and five. I mean, we've just every, all the steps have been covered so beautifully. That's why I just want to tell you all a story to, to end on. And, um, and I like the story. Because you know what the story is? It's God's story of what's happened in my life this far, this far. And I like telling it because I'm really telling God's story. And in four and five, I realized that there's one guy that screwed up everything and you're looking at him. And six and seven, I realized that God's given me an awful lot of good things and I abuse them in awful lot of different ways. And that I was going to have to put them to good purpose if I was to make this world a better place and to be able to live with myself. Um, there's some people on here that know the feeling of having talents, whatever they are, doesn't matter, that are untapped, underutilized, and I'm just not using them because I'm scared, right? And I'm a guy that had a lot of almosts, right? There was a poem that really touched me by Langston Hughes called a dream deferred and there's a course in that poem there's a lot of alliteration in the poem though which is it's it's a one of those poems that has a rhythm to it but it talks about you know does it fester does it breed the boogie woogie rumble of a dream deferred right and i know what a dream deferred is right it's that it's in the pit of my stomach right i was almost a college graduate i was almost a decent son i was almost you know valedictorian i was almost right a four-year division one athlete. I was almost a guy that was employable. I was almost on my way to write. And by the time I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I feel like all that's gone, water under the bridge. But as I'm working my way with this sponsor through these steps in this book, that's starting to change. I'm starting to feel something inside. And we got to step nine and he said to me, I'm very happy that you've done steps one, two, and three. Good for you that you've made some peace with the God of your understanding that you understand what's wrong with you, good for you, nobody cares. Not a single person out there in the world cares about that. Oh, you've written an inventory, you've shared it with me, good for you, very good, nobody cares. Not a single person out there in the world cares about that. Oh, six and seven, you're familiar with your assets in your life, good for you, nobody cares. And you got a list of what you're gonna make right in step eight, of course you do. You've been gonna make right your whole life, nobody cares. But step nine, kid, Step nine, this is your chance to rub the record clean, where maybe, just maybe, you get to die with both sides of the slate even, right? Maybe I get to put back into life what I took out. How free do you want to be? You can find somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous to co-sign anything. We've got all kinds of sobriety in AA. Look around. We got everything in here from ground beef to filet mignon. What would you like? I don't know about you, but I'm a pig, man. When I went out drinking, I, I wasn't like, oh, I'll just settle for the, you know, if you got some more available to me, I want it, right? That's, you know, and he was encouraging me to chase my sobriety with one half of the way that I chased my drinking and, and drugging and told me that I was going to be in great shape. And he said, I'd start dating your mother. And I'm totally employ unemployable. I am, you know, to this day, uh, with all these arrests, anybody that ran a background check wouldn't hire me. I applied to Walmart to be a nighttime janitor. They wouldn't hire me. McDonald's won't hire me to clean their floors. I can't clean bathrooms. Home Depot I applied to to stock shelves at night. They won't hire me. But a sober member of AA hired me to sweep the floors in this picture frame shop. Um, I got $6.25 an hour to just sweep the floor. And this guy was 28 years sober and I'm sweeping, sweeping, sweeping all day. And he's playing those AA tapes and uh and cds you know and i'm just listening listening to all of you right share your lives and your story and your miracles and i'm starting to smile while i'm sweeping and somehow that six dollars and 25 cents became a lot i don't know how a little becomes a lot in AA. when i focus on the spiritual the material always takes care of itself and the second i take my eye off the ball and look over at the stuff right the money property prestige it gets all screwed up but somehow when i focus on the spiritual the material just handles itself and i don't know how it happens i'm just telling you it does and uh 
what happens for me next is I'm dating my mom because he tells me, he says, once a week, ask her out. Wherever she'll go with you, you take her out. And I'm dating her and dating her and dating her and sweeping the floor. And I'm coming to my meetings and I'm starting to. Here's another way you know you're becoming what the book calls inwardly rearranged, right? Which is just another set of words for starting to awaken inside. Anybody here start to like going to meetings you didn't used to like to go to, right? The ones with those people and they're always talking about those weird, right? And all of a sudden I'm drawn to those weird people and I'm staying after the meeting and I'm asking questions uh, to the people with those weird smiles and stuff, right? Like something's starting to happen. And I'm dating my mom and like somehow it's becoming cool. Like how the hell is it cool to date your mom at 30? But it feels good, right? My shoulders are going back. My chest is coming out, right? And uh, as time goes by, my mom starts inviting me over to change light bulbs and take out her trash. She used to have a restraining order against me, right? I wasn't allowed 100 yards of her or her house for, you know, some of the stuff that I did that I don't even have time to tell you about. Um if she was given this talk right now, I'll tell you this. Uh, I got married, first marriage um, ever, at nine years sober. I always hesitate to tell this because half of you are not going to believe that I'm really alcoholic once I tell you this. Um, you know, because of my sponsor, we dated for like two years. Then we got engaged for about six months. Then we got married. Then after about a year of traveling around the world and having fun, uh, we intentionally got pregnant with our first child and then, and then we had our second like in that order i mean if i don't tell you anything else that in of itself is miraculous like who the hell does that certainly not you know me right and uh, but what my mom would tell you is that my son thanks to alcoholics anonymous chose to build a house about a mile and a half away and he built an in-law you know room on there with my own bathroom and i could go over and see my granddaughters whenever i want uh they're six and three i had to get them fed before i came to do this meeting tonight um i've also become a home school teacher here in the last couple of weeks i didn't know i signed up for that but apparently i did somewhere along the way and um that's a trip i could give an hour talk on that but i digress so my mom is, uh, she's over all the time in and out of our house. I had a little sister I hadn't talked to. She wouldn't talk to me for six and a half years. I had a set of Baltimore Ravens tickets. My sponsor said, send them, send them to her. And um, I said, that's stupid. You know, you're not listening. She hasn't talked to me in six and a half years. These are expensive. And um, he said, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And I sent them to my little sister and nothing happened. He said, send the next set. And, I did, and the phone rang, and on the other end of that phone was that little girl's voice, man, that I hadn't heard in over six years, going, Richie, Richie, did you see that? The Ravens just caught the ball. They're in the end zone. The game's tied up. There wasn't anything else I could, I mean, I could have cared less. I have no idea who the Ravens were playing. My sponsor tells me, he's like, you didn't even like the NFL now that you're sober. What you liked about the NFL was having a big tailgate in the parking lot, carving a prime rib, having the biggest bar, being a big shot right out at the tailgate, having the best tailgate party. By the time the game started, you were so drunk, you don't even know who won anyway. And that's the truth, man, of me with the NFL sober. I, I don't know the last time I've been to a game. I don't have four hours to sit still, man. I would much rather hang out with you guys, go surfing with my sober buddies, take somebody to whatever, right? Like, it just seems like I always got stuff to do uh, rather than sit around for four hours. But um, my sister and I developed this friendship, man, and it goes on, and I'm driving three hours to Baltimore on the weekends. She bought her first home. I'm helping her paint the walls. I'm being a big brother. And years go by and this guy calls me. I know who he is. And he says, hey, Rich, this is Justin. I know your father's no longer with you guys and a part of your lives. And you've become the number one man in your little sister's life. And uh, I'm calling to ask you for permission if I could ask her to marry me. And um, and I'm telling you, there's nobody less qualified to give away a beautiful little girl uh, than the crappy big brother you're looking at, you know. And the next day she called and asked if I'd walk her down the aisle and give her away. And I got to do that, you know, sober in my right mind, dressed appropriately. Everybody at that wedding knew that I was going to show up. There was no question about it because AA's made me so reliable that some might call me boring. And it turns out that that's a great compliment, that you know precisely where I'm gonna be and what I'm gonna be doing on any given night of the week and any given day. I'm no longer a loose cannon. That's how people used to refer to me, right? You don't know what you're getting when he shows up. Um, 
I had a friend, eighth, and I'm going to tell you about two more and, and, and shut up as we come down the home stretch. I, I know you guys have been sitting all weekend and, uh, you know, you probably need one more AA meeting. Like you need one, like a hole in the head. Right. But anyways, this friend, eighth of mine was my oldest friend since, since childhood. And he asked me to be the best man in his wedding. I'm living out in California and La Jolla taking over the world, one drug deal at a time. And, uh, his father sent me a plane ticket and paid to have me fit it and bought me a tuxedo. And the night before I was supposed to fly back and get that 7:30 AM flight, I started drinking to get ready for the wedding. Cause I was really excited about it. And I don't need to tell you guys how that ended up, right? We get tight at exactly the wrong time and the important engagement cannot be kept. I don't show up at the wedding. When I do something like that, I don't call. I have to avoid your phone calls. I know why you're calling, right? You're calling to tell me I'm a no good bum. You're calling to cuss me out. So now you're one more person that I can't talk to. And the years go by and I hear that he's got a wife, that, that the wife's wonderful. They've had a child, a daughter, then they've had a son. And uh, Roger, my sponsor, Roger, now he says, you know, he was the one guiding me through the ninth step. He said, this is the one that's next. And, and I call Ethan and I say, I'm on this thing called the ninth step. I got to do my best to clean up the wreckage of my past. I know I screwed up your wedding. I know I'm a lousy friend. Uh, this is like a life or death deal, dude. I'm sure you hate me. Can I have 15 minutes so that I don't ever have to drink again to try to fix this with you? And maybe your dad could be there. And he said, yeah, you could be here 9 a.m. on Monday morning if you can make it. And that was years later. So I think he had one of those resentments that you guys talk about. And I show up and his, uh, his parents' car is in the driveway. And as he opens the door, his wife's standing by a kitchen island with the little girl next to her, his mother and father in the back of the kitchen and out of some back room. And this little boy comes running at me and he grabs a hold of my leg like a tree trunk. And he looks up and he goes, you're my uncle, Rich. Daddy said one day I'd get to meet you. And this little boy was so happy to meet me. And I knew that he'd been telling these kids what a scumbag I was, how I ruined his wedding. Yeah, he hadn't been telling them any of that. And with that little kid holding on to my leg, man, I saw it was like the Bill says those scales, right, of pride and prejudice. They fell from my eyes and I had an inward knowing, right? You guys didn't convince me of anything. You didn't sell me anything. You didn't convince me. In the process of doing this deal, man, I had an inward knowing that I am what separate me from you. Due to my stupid ego, my inability to admit that I've screwed it all up, my inability to say, I'm sorry, how can I fix this? I missed three or four years of those kids' lives. I missed my friendship with him. I'm what separates me from you. We've already heard when I'm separate from you, I'm separate from God. I went in and sat down with his father. I made my amends to his father and uh, told him I'm sorry. You know, I, I, did, I know you spent this money and I didn't show up and then. Anyways, he said, yeah, you owe me $1,372. And I didn't see that coming either, you know, and I reached in my pocket and I got the money. And he goes, no, you're not going to pay me. If you're really in this AA thing the way you say you are, what you're going to do is no more than $10 at a time. You're going to take some fancy donuts or something nice to your home group, maybe buy some coffee, right? Maybe get them some Starbucks every now and then, treat them to a little something nice. No more than 10 bucks at a time. Maybe you put some gas in a newcomer's car. I'll tell you, you always put the gas in their car. You never give them the cash, right? And uh, he said, you save each receipt. And when you have $1,372 of receipts, none of them can be for more than $10 at a time. You bring them to me. And on that day, your amends to me will be complete. By the way, I'm sober and Alcoholics Anonymous for 28 years. And I've been praying for the two of you since you've been little guys. And uh, that was the day that my home group, some of you have been to it, primary purpose group, big book study in Ocean City, Maryland. That was the day we became an eating meeting because Stouffer's lasagnas are $9 and 95 cents. And I would buy one of those and I would start to cook it, you know, right? You cook it with the tin foil on at 375 degrees for an hour and a half. Then you pull the tin foil off for the last 15 minutes. You let that cheese crust over. Then I get the plates and the forks and the little spatula so that when I get to the meeting, we can actually cut it and serve it and all eating. And you know what I learned from that amends? You know what that guy taught me? He was teaching me to think about you before I was even with you. That Alcoholics Anonymous starts before that meeting starts, man. And I was learning to think about you, love for you, and care for you almost two hours before I got to your meeting. What a gift he gave me. My last amend I'm going to tell you about and shut up this story is I had an old warrant. My last warrant to clean up was out in California. I was given a five-year suspended sentence for a DUI. 
with an eight ball of cocaine in my pocket, he gave me probation instead of five years. You know, in, in prison, I screwed up the probation. When I violate probation, I run away. I've already told you that because I'm a coward. And uh, I had about two years sober, and he said, this is a good time to go serve that five years in prison and be free. You're already in jail. Every night you go to bed, you know that there's a warrant for you. You're already in jail. You might as well get it over. It's good to have a sponsor because they see things different. I didn't feel that way, I assure you. But he did. And uh, and he and a bunch of my sponsees took me to the airport. I, I flew out there and stood in front of that judge. And, um, and I was scared to death, turned myself in and all of that. And... Um, what I didn't know was that 40 some members of AA, you guys took the time to write letters to the judge telling him what my life looked like and the thousands of AA meetings I went to. And I got a big book study on Wednesdays in my living room and I mopped floors and all this kind of stuff. And the judge said, uh, he looks through all these letters. He said, I've never seen anything like this. You flew 3000 miles on your own nickel to come through five years in prison. And I said, yes, your honor, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got two years. I know exactly what I had at the time, uh, sober. And uh, I don't ever want to have to drink again. So I'd like, I didn't do what I told you I'd do. So if we could get this started, I look forward to being a free man. And he hit down that gavel and he said, you've exceeded the terms of probation, not the way I told you, but you've completed them. If I was you, I'd go back to Maryland, do whatever those people in Alcoholics Anonymous tell you to do. And I couldn't even believe it. I've told you I've walked into a courtroom 36 times and I've gone to jail 36 times. I've never walked out of a courtroom. That was the first time I walked out. My God got so much bigger that day. And I called Roger on the phone and I said, Roger, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And he said, wait a second. You had a one-way ticket. You got to buy a one-way ticket home. for You can't get home until tomorrow. It's only one o'clock out there in California. Why don't you go over to that University of San Diego, the Jesuits that kicked you out and make that right before you come home tomorrow? And uh, I'll tell you this. I don't know if you guys can see it, but... That right there, that's a one-way ticket home from San Diego. That's the best plane ticket that I've ever purchased in my life was that one-way ticket home from San Diego. And that's the day that my God grew exponentially because I'd never seen anything like it. And I went over to the University of San Diego and I made amends to that dean that kicked me out. Yes, it was the same one nine years later because that's how God is. And I said, Dean, I know what I did. I brought a lot of shame to the Jesuits getting kicked out of here. And I don't know if you even remember me. My name, you know, she said, we remember you, Rich. We've only had one student go to the federal penitentiary in the history of the university. And uh, I told her, you know, I know the harm that I did was bringing shame. I know what the Jesuits are, thanks to AA and becoming a spiritual seeker. You stand for building men and women of integrity and doing the right thing. I didn't stand for any of that when I went here. And I don't know how to fix this, but I'll do whatever you tell me. And she said, if that's true, come with me. And she took me to a building next door and put a big stack of papers in front of me and told me to fill it out. She said, this is an application to our law school. What do we want you to do is to go here and graduate. And we want you to go on and make us proud. We like to graduate people and we like our alumni to make us proud. That's how you're going to fix this. And I stepped outside and I called my sponsor and I said, Roger, this dean's lost her mind. She wants me to go to law school. Even if I somehow get through law school, they'll never let me take the bar. If I pass the bar, they'll never let me through the ethics deal. They're never going to give me a law license, man. I'm, you know, I can't even work at McDonald's. And he said, shut up. Did you just tell that lady you do whatever she said? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, then fill out the papers. And I did. Three years later, I graduated second from the top of my class. Not because I'm smart. I just did it the AA way. I showed up half hour early for every class. I stayed after ask the teacher a question, whether I really had one or not, just to build the relationship. See, these principles you taught me, if I apply them in other areas of my life, you cannot help but succeed in other areas of life. AA is a formula of living, man. It's a way of life that works in tough going. It works everywhere, right? And I just take it out there into the world and apply it. A couple of weeks, you know, I got through the bar. I got through all, it's more than I have time to tell you about. My phone rang, it was a guy that said he was the state's attorney for the state of Maryland. I know what state's attorneys are. They're the ones that always lock me up, right? I've been to jail 36 times. I know what a state's attorney is. And dude says, hold on a second. I got to patch through the governor's office. He wants to talk. We've been given a large uh, federal grant. I'm supposed to hire an assistant state's attorney for the state to head up our narcotics prosecution division. We've been given your phone number that you know something about the importation of narcotics. Uh, we'd like to ask you to serve as our state's attorney in charge of the narcotics division. My knees about buckled. I was like, you got to be kidding me. 
I can't work anywhere. And they want me to be the assistant state's attorney in charge of narcotics division. But you know what I remember? Those old guys, man, those old guys with that book in their hand and that smile on their face. They always told me, they said, kid, one day your sordid past will become your greatest asset. And it was. And for 10 years, I ended up becoming the senior state's attorney for the state of Maryland. I, I got to do some things, man, a drunk like me should never get to do. I got to co-author the Good Samaritan Law, that if somebody overdoses and there's other people there that call it in, that they don't, you can't arrest them. I got to testify in front of the Senate and the House about that law. My law was you know, published. I got to implement the drug courts into the state of Maryland that I saw other places. The things, the things that I got to do, uh, you know, were, were nothing short of miraculous and really putting into the, you know, the stream of life and really putting some good back into the state of Maryland and helped lots and lots of people. After 10 years, uh, I resigned the right way. I collected my half pension that you get after 10 years. Uh, and then I followed that boogie woogie rumble. There was still something inside of me. And that boogie woogie rumble, that dream that I was never good enough for was to own my own law firm. And I went out and uh, with my wife's blessing and, and a baby in the belly and, and a three-year-old at that point resigned and followed a dream because you guys taught me to do that. Uh, we have become by far the, the largest DUI defense firm on the Eastern shore of Maryland. I just did my taxes, which means la I know exactly last year I defended 317 DUI cases. And you know what that means? Doesn't mean I'm a big shot lawyer. You know what it means? It means 317 times I got to sit here and right across the desk is somebody just like me, somebody just like you. And I get to go, I can't help but notice that this is your fourth DUI. You think this one's bad luck too? Or you think maybe there's a problem? And we're the first spiritual law firm that I'm aware of. And what that means is that if you stay sober for one year and bring me a one-year AA chip, you get half your legal feedback. And, um, and I know what some of you scam artists are thinking because I know who's on this call. I already told you Ocean City is an island seven miles long by one mile. There is no way you can stay sober for a year on this island and me not see you in the meetings. So I know whether they really stayed sober or not. And... Uh, you know, and I've gotten to do that a handful of times. It's, it's not a lot, but it's every now and then. Uh, you guys have given me a life worth living. And um, I'd like to go on and on because I'm excited to be with you. And I don't want to shut up because if I shut up, this meeting's going to end. You guys are going to say goodbye. And I'm going to go back to that, um, to quarantining and praying and meditating and relying on oh my God that this is all going to shake out and that we're going to be together again soon. And uh, God only knows I miss you guys and I can't wait to be with you in person. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much, Rich. I love you, buddy. There's not much else to say, I don't think, other than we've made it to the close of the Fellowship of the Spirit in New York uh, coronavirus edition. And uh, we do have a typical way of closing, and I've asked um, one of the guys that, that started this whole weekend off, Mickey, to take us out. But I, I, there's a couple of paragraphs earlier in the chapter of Vision for You that really speak to me. And I feel like it really encapsulates what happened this weekend. So I'm going to read that first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mickey to read the traditional closing and, and, and pray us out. We have shown you how we got out from under. Excuse me. You say, yes, I'm willing. But am I to be consigned to a life where I shall be stupid, boring, and glum like some righteous people I see. I know I must get along without liquor, but how can I? Have you a sufficient substitute? Yes, there is a substitute, and it is vastly more than that. It is a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. There, you will find release from care, boredom, and worry. Your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus we find fellowship, and so will you. 
Among them you will make lifelong friends. You will be bound to them with new and wonderful ties. For you will escape disaster together and you will commence shoulder to shoulder your common journey. Then you will know what it means to give of yourself that others may survive and rediscover life. You will learn the full meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our good friend, Mickey, who's gonna take us out. Are you there, Mickey? I sure am. Can you hear me? We got you. Um, I just have a couple of comments and then we're gonna, we're gonna pray together, but you can't imagine, you cannot imagine what it's like for us. There were three people, Don and Marie and I, and as we shared at the beginning, we each coughed up Marie and I $250 and Don put in $250 and we got a hotel in, in the mountains in Colorado and Don got the manpower and woman power to do this thing. And it's 27 years later and uh, we circled the globe. And I just want to say this, if anybody gives you the idea that one person or two people or three people can't change the world, we just saw it this weekend. We just saw it this weekend. And for Maria and I, we've grown old in service and in love with you. So um, I'd like to read something. It's familiar. It's on page 164. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Now we'll close with the Lord's prayer and uh, I, I'm with Rich. It's just like, who wants to let go? Nobody wants to let go right now. So we won't. So we won't. We'll stay together. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And God bless. And until we meet again.